afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Care Connection, the free live webinar. Before we begin, I would like to go over a little bit of housekeeping. For the duration of this presentation, we will be in listen-only mode. On the right-hand side, you will see a panel, and on that panel, you will be able to type in your questions. At the end of the presentation, I will read the questions and Michelle uh, and rather Britt Berner will be answering them. In addition, we have handouts on the right hand side for you to take. We will be beginning our presentation in just a moment's time. Okay, everybody, we will begin. I want to introduce our guest speaker, Britt Berner, and today's topic is going to be Guardianship 101. Britt Berner is an attorney at Berner Law Group. She's practicing in the areas of elder law, estate planning, guardianship, and trusts and estates. She is the chair of the New York City Bar Association Committee on the Legal Problems of the Aging and is an active member of the Executive Committee of the Elder Law and Special Needs Planning Section of the New York State Bar Association. Berner Law Group has offices in Manhattan, East Atucket, and West Hampton Beach. Without further ado, I'm very excited to have Britt Berner as our presenter today. So, Britt, please begin. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Heather said, my name is Britt Berner, um, and I'm an attorney practicing in New York State. Um, our law firm has three offices and practices solely in the areas that Heather described, um, and a lot of the work that we do involves a guardianship proceeding in one way or another. So what we're going to do today is just go through what guardianship is, why you may need a guardianship, and I would like to give a few disclaimers right off the bat. Uh, first, nothing that we're discussing today is legal advice. Obviously, if you have a specific situation, we're happy to answer questions at the end. Uh, but any questions I do answer um, come with the caveat that you should seek the counsel of an attorney who can hear more fully your information and also respond to you regarding to the laws of the state in which you live. Uh, that brings me to my second disclaimer, which is that Guardianship law, very and and actually all of the areas of law that I practice, estate planning, uh, government benefits with elder law, these are all very state specific laws. While there are certain things that we'll talk about that are going to be consistent throughout the country, um, the the concept of guardianship or conservatorship is the same everywhere. But the actual imp uh, way that the laws are put to practice are going to be different everywhere. And at the end of the presentation, you'll also see that there are some uh, information and resources for how you can find somebody locally to assist you if you have a specific situation. So all that being said, uh, guardianship 101. So first, what is a guardianship or a conservatorship? Um, again, this is based on local state law. And we are talking about the ideas of people with incapacity or diminished capacity. So this is a very important distinction when we're looking at guardianship because a lot of people think somebody has to be deemed incapacitated by the court in order for someone to help take over. And that's not the legal standard. Usually you just have to show that there's someone who is unable to make decisions for themselves um, and una unable to understand the consequences of this inability. I often have people come to me and say, um, for example, I have a family member who is an alcoholic and I need to become their guardian. Unfortunately, you know, somebody being an alcoholic and choosing to make bad decisions is not a reason to have a guardianship. Now, I have had situations where somebody has been an alcoholic and as a result, they've had a diminished capacity, they've had cognitive impairments that have come as a result of that, and therefore it is appropriate for a guardianship. But our laws allow us or allow us as humans to make bad decisions. So unfortunately, um, we can't stop people just from making bad decisions if there is not some sort of further impairment. Um, 
often there's a guardian of personal needs and property management. So a personal needs guardian would deal with if you're unable to make medical decisions, decisions about where to live, social decisions about who to visit with, et cetera. And property management has to do with handling finances, real property, living, you know, selling your home, signing a lease, uh, or entering into any kind of contracts. And New York, um, specifically, uh, it's not a medical standard, it's a factual determination. So when I say that, what I mean is, when you submit a Medicaid application, it's actually not a given that the medical information will be released. Everybody still does have what are called HIPAA rights. So um, the Healthcare uh, Information Portability and Accountability Act is a federal law that protects all of our medical information. And so really when you're submitting a Medicaid application, you're talking about the facts and the stories and the anecdotes as to why somebody is unable to handle their own affairs. You're not looking at um, the medical reason behind it necessarily. Um, and we're always looking at the least restrictive alternative with guardianship. So we only want to give a guardian the amount of powers that are necessary in order to help somebody live a, a full life. Um, and we only, so if somebody is able to handle certain things on their own, then we don't have to give that power to the guardian. They can still manage that on their own. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the powers in a few minutes. It is also um, important to point out that when we're talking about guardianship, we want to make sure that the individual who is the subject of the guardianship proceeding is allowed to have the most amount of independence possible for them. And that's really what we're referring to when we talk about the least restrictive alternative. We do not want to take away the rights of a person who is otherwise able to handle certain things on their own. Um, an example is, you know, we've had people who have been deemed unable to handle their affairs, unable to manage their checkbook, make medical decisions, but they do have the capacity required in New York State to sign a last will and testament. And so there's not, a guardian can't do that on your behalf in any, in any case, but there are people who, while are, don't have the capacity to handle certain things in their day-to-day -day life, they still have the capacity to know who their family members are and what their assets are and how they want them to be distributed at their death. And therefore, they have the legal capacity to sign a last will and testament. Next, I'm going to talk about the roles. So these are the different people who are involved in a guardianship. A petitioner is the person who actually petitions the court and says this person needs a guardian appointed for them because they're unable to handle their own affairs and they don't understand the nature and consequences of that inability. A cross petitioner. So an example of a cross petitioner would be if a daughter petitions and says my mother needs a guardian appointed for her because she's unable to handle her affairs. And then maybe the son steps in and says, well, I want to be my mom's guardian, not my sister. So I'm going to cross petition and I am going to ask that I be appointed as guardian. An AIP is a term we use for alleged incapacitated person. So in the example I just gave, the mother would be the alleged incapacitated person. She is alleged to be incapacitated until the proceeding is finished and a determination, a determination is made by the court as to whether or not she is incapacitated. A court evaluator. The court evaluator is often known as the eyes and ears of the court. So this is a person who is usually a lawyer but does not have to be in New York State. Um, and the court evaluator gets appointed right at the beginning when the petition is filed and the, and the judge sets the, the case on. And the court evaluator goes out and does an investigation. So they find out, they speak to all of the family members, they speak to any neighbors who may have information, anyone else who has been determined as part of this petition or through the investigation as someone who may have information that's relevant to the proceeding. And then the court evaluator writes a report and testifies at the hearing and gives and does not represent any individual party, but their goal is to give recommendations to the court based on all the information they found out. Part of the reason this is done is because in New York State specifically, a guardianship proceeding, if you file a petition and the judge signs the order setting the court date, the court date has to be within 28 days of that, of that 
uh, order being signed. And so it's very important that the court evaluator go out and quickly gather as much information as possible, as opposed to having a full court proceeding where people are brought into court. My understanding is that in other states, it is not quite as streamlined and it does is a longer, it is a longer process. Um, Counsel to the AIP. So in certain circumstances, the court can hire a lawyer or appoint a lawyer to represent the alleged incapacitated person. Uh, this is someone who is supposed to stand up and state the wishes of the incapacitated, alleged incapacitated person. I have had clients before who have had uh, been, it's very clear that they're, to me, as their counsel, that they are not aware of how do what their finances are. They can't tell me what are in their bank accounts. They can't tell me what their bills are. They can't tell me who the people are in their life, who their family members are. They're very confused. However, when I stand up and represent them in court, my job is to stand up and say what they want me to say. And even if that is that they do not want a guardian appointed for them, then that's my job is to stand up and say, my client does not want a guardian appointed. Now that doesn't mean a guardian won't be appointed because if the evidence is shown that they need one, the judge can rule that way. But that is the purpose of the counsel to the AIP. And other interested parties. So the other people who are involved are if the individual, the AIP is in a hospital, then the administrator of the hospital will be noticed. If the um, uh, person has certain family members who are very close to them, even if they're not children or siblings of the inca alleged incapacitated person, then they will be noticed as well. And then in New York, the statute requires that those close family members receive notice of the proceeding. Uh, and then actually, I just want to add two other roles, which are, as we talked about, the guardian of the person or guardian of the property. I talked about those in a prior slide, but a guardian of the property in some states is referred to as a conservator. Um, whereas the guardian refers specifically to the person making medical and social decisions on the person's behalf. Who can commence a guardianship action? So any of these people listed here can commence a guardianship action. I've had clients who have had APS called by a neighbor or some other person. They don't know who called it. An APS came into the home and determined that there was a risk. And then New York City, as a result, um, brought a guardianship proceeding saying this person is unsafe at home and needs to be cared for by a guardian. And that's how that those start. And then also one other person who can commence a guardianship action is someone for themselves. I had a client recently who was the recipient of or was to be the recipient of a large settlement. She has some cognitive impairments um, from a traumatic brain injury and some physical impairments. And she's able to know well enough that she's very vulnerable and that she's easily taken advantage of by close family members and friends. And she knows she needs a guardian to protect her assets and to help her establish certain government benefits and make doctor's appointments and handle her her day to day. But she doesn't have somebody who she can who she can trust. And so in that case, she knew she was vulnerable and she was able to petition the court and on consent had a guardian appointed for her. And when I say on consent, I mean she consented. So she was not determined to be incapacitated, but she was determined to be a person in need of a guardian who otherwise, again, that's back to that factual determination, it was determined by the facts presented to the court that she did have that need and that she would benefit from a guardian being appointed. Why does someone commence a guardianship action? So, um, as I said, there can be cognitive impairment. You can't balance a checkbook. You can't uh, check your mail, pay your bills, coordinate the care that you need in your home. Uh, vulnerability, so as I discussed, family member abuse or maybe a senior scams. Um, and then improper actions or invalid documents. So often we have clients who come to us and their family member uh, perhaps has never signed a power of attorney or a healthcare proxy. If you have a valid power of attorney or healthcare proxy, then you likely don't need a guardian appointed, um, except for in the few circumstances I'm going to discuss in a minute, because you have someone who is appointed to make those decisions for you. Um, I did have one client who had a valid power of attorney but didn't have a healthcare proxy, and they were living in an apartment, and the family members had to 
request that the court appoint a guardian of the person, the two children be appointed as the guardian of the person, because they weren't able to make to do certain things. For example, they were in a building in New York City and there was a doorman. And if this gentleman went outside, he would get lost. But if the but the doorman didn't have the right to stop him because he had his free will and he there was nothing they could do. Um, and when the police were called, it was often hard to get the police to understand that the kids had this power to make decisions for their father. And so they were appointed the guardian of his person so that they can make those decisions for him speak with the doctors, et cetera. We also have people who have documents in place, but they're not sufficient. I had someone who had a power of attorney and they came to see us to, to do certain asset transfers and, and to help their mother qualify for Medicaid. And in the end, they brought the power of attorney to the bank. And while the power of attorney document was valid, it didn't have all of the powers listed in it that were necessary in order to transfer the assets and make the person eligible. And so while the documents were valid, they weren't sufficient and they didn't do what needed to be done for that individual. And then the last, the other time that you can have these documents but not have them be valid in that you need a guardian is if there are bad acts of your power of attorney. So improper actions by appointed agents. So if your power of attorney is found to have been stealing from you, um, or if they are, if you have a son and a daughter, I had a case once there was a son and a daughter and it turned out the daughter found out that the son was transferring all the assets in a way that would essentially have disinherited the daughter at, at dad's death. So you, they, power of attorney was doing something contrary to what dad's wishes were. Um, and so that is all grounds for bringing a guardianship proceeding, especially if it's found that that person uh, doesn't have the ability to stop the agent under the power of attorney from doing these improper actions or to revoke the power of attorney document. So what are the pros of having a guardianship? So one is court oversight. So if you're naming somebody who is, I had a client who didn't have any close friends or family at all, and she wanted to name uh, an accountant that she had known for many years as her uh, person to handle things for her upon her possible incapacity in the future. But she didn't feel comfortable giving a power of attorney to this person because she wanted the court oversight. She wanted to make sure that if this person was serving as her guardian, that they were following the rules and they were accounting to the court. Um, I also, there are documents you can create that nominate a guardian in advance. So that's what this woman did. She said, I don't want to sign a power of attorney, but I'm going to nominate a guardian, which means she signed a document that said, if I become incapacitated to the point where a guardian is necessary to be appointed, this is the person that I prefer. And the court generally will favor that person as long as there's not a specific reason not to appoint them. Um, Another pro is that you get orders from the court on big decisions. So, for example, sale of property. Uh, sometimes I find that if a power of attorney is being used at a closing, the title company may give a hard time. They don't like the form of the document. It doesn't refer specifically to that property, but it might have been a power of attorney that was signed while the individual had capacity and they no longer do, whereas in this case, if you have an order from the court saying that property can be sold, it's very specific and there are less issues at the closing. Another pro is this, is third party institution recognition of the authority. So similar to the title company, as an example, if they'll, they'll recognize a document. Also, a lot of people um, have trouble that the power of attorney document is not regularly accepted by certain banks and they, uh, it's, it's, often very difficult to fight with a bank about this, whereas they find if they go in with a court order stating that they have the power to handle the bank accounts, this is gonna be less of an issue. Now for the cons, uh, you'll notice it again says court oversight. Um, so for someone who, like the woman I described, who wanted the court oversight because she's naming someone she doesn't know all too well as guardian, then for her, court oversight was a good thing. But if it's a situation where mom is naming one of her children and everybody's on the same page and everybody agrees and there's full trust and there's not any issues, then the court oversight can be a frustrating situation because it requires um, 
all the reporting requirements. So in New York, we have an annual reporting requirement. So every year in May, anyone in New York State who's appointed as a guardian has to file annual reports with the court, updating on the, if they're the personal needs guardian, updating on the, on the health of the individual, but also if they are the property management guardian, giving a full accounting of how the money was used. Um, I see this as particularly difficult in a situation where there's a spouse who needs to be appointed as a guardian for an incapacitated spouse, because even though many of their assets are often joint, some of them are not, and there are certain things that an individual needs their own signature power and the spouse doesn't have the automatic right for. And then I find myself in a situation where I'm telling a spouse of 55 years that they need to be telling the court how they used all of the money that came into the bank account, the social security money, the pension money, whatever it may be for their spouse. And that's a very hard thing for people to understand why they all of a sudden have to be giving this information to the court. Um, there are also costs associated with the guardianship. There's an attorney who will file the petition for guardianship most often who needs to be paid by the petitioner. There is payment of the different people appointed by the court. So we talked about the court evaluator who needs to get paid, the lawyer for the alleged incapacitated person who needs to get paid, and then ongoing, there's a court examiner who is in charge of reviewing those accountings every year, and that person gets a fee. There's often also a bond imposed, so that is uh, insurance on the state of the person who is uh, deemed incapacitated. And so basically, if the court says, okay, they have stocks, bonds, real estate, annual income, cash, what does that add up to? And now we want to insure that the state for that amount, and that carries an annual premium with it, which is something that has to be paid out of the incapacitated person's money by the guardian. And there are also commissions to the guardian. So a, a guardian can waive commissions and can say, I don't want to take commissions, I don't want to take payment for the work I've done. But especially if you're looking, if there's not a family member who's going to serve as guardian, often the commissions will be paid because the guardian is a person being pointed appointed off of the court's list, an attorney or another person who practices in the area who can be the guardian, and those commissions are paid as well. Um, I also want to point out, and this is, this is a New York specific issue, which is that who pays the fees? So in New York, if a person, it's up to the court what the fees will be, Attorneys can submit their affirmations and ask for certain fees, but the court in the end makes the decision on fees, and the court determines who pays the fees. Most often, the fees are paid by the person who ends up having the guardian appointed for them. The money comes out of their estate. The guardian uses their money to pay it. Um, but we have had situations where a petitioner can end up being stuck with the fees because maybe they brought a petition alleging that somebody was incapacitated and the court found it found that a guardian wasn't needed. And that can be a very large price to pay if it's a long drawn out process. This is an example of some guardian of the person powers. So these are um, dealing with medical care, consenting for treatment, um, making sure the ward, that's a kind of an old fashioned, but it's another word for the, for the person who ends up with a guardian who is either deemed incapacitated or a person in need of a guardian, making sure they're fed, housed, educated, entertained, supervised. Um, that might mean hiring home health aides. Um, and it could also be to be the representative payee on a social security payment if there's no guardian of the property. So it might be that the only money that this person receives is a monthly check that just goes from social, comes in from social security and then goes right out to pay bills. And so sometimes in certain states, the guardian of the person can be that representative payee and also to pay debts. Um, usually there needs to be specific powers in the guardianship order regarding major medical treatments. And we usually define major medical treatments as being procedures involving general anesthesia and end of life decisions. I know there are multiple cases, um, certainly here in New York State, and I'm sure other parts of the country as well, where a guardian who is appointed to make medical decisions then has to petition the court as a person goes to end of life and ask the court for the, possibly ask the court for the power to 
withdraw treatment or withhold certain treatments, which would serve to end the person's life. And then that can end up being its own drawn out proceeding, even after a guardian has been appointed to make the decision as to whether or not the guardian has the right to make those decisions. Next is the guardian of the estate property. This is the one that I said that in some states they refer to this as a conservator. And these are the powers, um, investment of assets, management of bank accounts, maintaining the home. That might mean um, anything from making sure that it's clean on the inside to making sure the gutters are cleaned out, uh, the lawn is mowed, whatever is necessary in that person's life and signing tax returns, um, participating in operation or management of the ward's business, um, dependents, if that's necessary, um, maintain fiduciary accounts. So if somebody has, say, a checking account with $20,000 in it, and then a guardian is appointed, the guardian will then go to the bank and have that account closed and the money transferred into a fiduciary account, which is a guardianship account. A fiduciary is any person like an executor of a will or a power of attorney who has a standard of duty to another person, and a guardian falls under that category. And then once it's a guardianship account, many banks don't allow guardianship accounts to have ATM cards, for example, and so basically the guardian has to move it into this type of account and then figure out how the bills are going to get paid from that point on. And uh, the guardian of the property or the conservator provides for the cost of care. They don't necessarily have to be the ones to arrange for it. So in some situations, the guardian of the person and the guardian of the property are the same person. And so they're making, they're arranging for the home health aids and they're also making sure that they are paid properly. But in other situations, they are two separate people. Maybe one person is handling those health matters, whereas another is handling the finances, and then they have to work together in order to provide for that cost of care um, and arrange it as well. And really, the powers that are given to the guardian um, on the personal needs and the property management side depend on what the life of this person is. If there is a person who's deemed to be incapacitated, who is completely incapacitated and can't do anything for themselves, they're going to be much longer list of powers and they're going to be narrowly tailored to that person's life in that if they have a business that they were running before they became incapacitated, well then the guardian's going to have to do something with the business on their behalf. They might, depending on the type of business, they might have to continue the business or they might have to wrap it up and, and sell it. Um, I, ha I know a person who's a guardian for many people and he was recently telling me about how he is actually a guardian for someone who owns multiple rental properties. So he has found himself not only now as a landlord, but uh, not only a guardian, but also as a landlord to many people because he has to operate these buildings because that was the business that this person ran. Does a guardianship last forever? Um, the duration of a guardianship is usually determined at the hearing. I was recently involved in a guardianship where the woman needed someone to help her move from her home to assisted living, surrender the apartment, it was a rental, clean out the apartment. There were, there were a lot of issues of cleanliness and, and some extermination that was necessary. And then once she was in the, the assisted living facility, there were enough things set up already in her life between family members and her own abilities that she could carry on the day-to-day -day of her life from that point on, but she really needed somebody to get her over that first hurdle. And so in that situation, we had a guardianship that only was a temporary guardianship that only lasted for a year. And at the end of that year, we checked in with the court and made sure that everything was taken care of and then the guardian could be discharged. Whereas many guardianships need to be for an infinite duration because we don't anticipate that the person is going to regain their capacity and we believe that the powers granted to the guardian are going to be necessary for the remainder of that person's life. Now, there are situations where a guardianship is appointed for ever and the person regains their capacity or maybe the powers need to be um, pared down because they're not necessary anymore. And in that case, anyone can petition the court for the guardianship to be terminated or for the powers to be adjusted or if they don't think the guardian is doing a good job for the guardian to be removed. 
That can be a family member or it could even be the incapacitated person or person in need of a guardian themselves who can say, I've gotten better, this is how, and I want the court to look at this issue again and make a decision. How do you avoid a guardianship? So we've talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but through planning is, is the, the quick answer. So making sure that you have enough supports in place, legal supports in place, so that a guardian isn't necessary. So if you have a very comprehensive power of attorney and a comprehensive healthcare proxy that includes the power to make end-of-life decisions, then you are setting yourself up to say, I, I may become incapacitated, I may not have the ability to handle things for myself, but I have very clearly in legal documents put somebody else or multiple people in those decision-making capacities so that they can, sub it's called substituted decision-making, they can make those decisions on my behalf and then I won't need the court to get involved and appoint a guardian. I point out also here the MULST form. Um, in New York, it's called the MULST it's Measures of Life Sustaining Treatment. I know in other states, I've seen it be referred to as a PULST form with a P. And this is a document that is signed by the individual and their doctor. And it lists very specifically the types of care that somebody may want to have. Um, so the types of care that are on that form, talk about end of life and uh, different decisions based on treatments of certain illnesses or, la or not providing those treatments. Um, so the, again, the short answer is how do you avoid a guardianship? Planning, making sure that things are in place so that if you do lose some of your abilities, there is someone in, in place to make those decisions for you. These are some things that guardians may not do. Uh, they cannot stop someone from getting married. They can't vote for someone. Um, I mentioned before, they cannot sign a last will and testament or a codicil to a last will and testament on behalf of someone else. And then there's some here, you need court approval um, to consent to a civil commitment, to electric shock treatment, or to dis dissolution of marriage. Um, a guardian is not going to commence a divorce proceeding. However, they can defend a divorce proceeding on behalf of the person that they have been appointed to represent. The Uniform Adult Guardianship and Protective Proceedings Jurisdiction Act. This is, I just want to make a correction on this slide. Actually, it's all states except Florida, Kansas, Texas, and Michigan. Um, but this is a law that was created um, and, and slowly adopted by states across the country. And what it does is it says that if there is a guardianship here in New York, say, and somebody moves out of state, it's trying to streamline the way that that guardianship is accepted in the other state. Um, and so uh, I'll give a few examples. Um, so a uh, example of someone recently who has come to us who is in one of the four states that there is not the Uniform Act, they have a resident of New York, they have property here in New York, but they also own property in one of the states that have not taken on this act. And so what is going to be required is we had a guardian appointed here in New York who is going to handle their affairs and pay their bills and do all of the day to day. But part of the plan is that they were hoping to sell a piece of property that is located in one of these other states. And so what they're going to have to do is go get a guardian appointed in that other state. And they're going to have to essentially start from the beginning in that other state and have a guardian appointed according to the laws of how that state does it. Now, in some states, it might not be that big of a deal, but they've already gone through the process here. So it can be very frustrating for family members, especially who, to have to do this in another state, especially if they're not located in that other state. Whereas if the property had been in a state where there is the Uniform Act has been adopted, well then what would all, all the, well, that would have to be done to sell that real property in that other state would be to register the New York State guardianship order in that other state. And the state has in its law, in the uniform law, it says how you do register that with the court. 
but you register that document. You basically file it in the new state, and then now the guardian has the right to follow the powers that were granted in New York in that other state as well. So it's been very helpful when clients own property in multiple states that have taken on the act. It's also helpful if people move. The idea is if you're living in New York and you have a guardian appointed here and then you decide to move to another state and that state has a uniform act, it's a lot easier and there's a process put forth for how to transfer that guardianship again rather than starting over. We've also had situations where, especially where states have close borders, like New York and New Jersey or New York and Connecticut, where maybe the family lives in New York, but the best treatment facility for the individual is in a neighboring state. And so sometimes they, they're, they're moving their loved one to that neighboring state and they need to transfer the guardianship in that situation. Um, there are also situations where um, there's a fight over where mom is going to live and mom doesn't have the capacity to make those decisions. And so, for example, you can have a situation where uh, the daughter lives here in New York and the son comes to visit and on the last day when the daughter's grocery shopping, the son has mom get in the car and takes mom back to Pennsylvania and daughter comes home and mom's not in the house anymore. And it used to be that if there wasn't this uniform act, the daughter would be forced to go to Pennsylvania and bring a guardianship proceeding in Pennsylvania because that's where mom was physically located. But now there are, there are rules in the uniform act that allow the daughter to bring that proceeding in New York and allows for communication between New York and Pennsylvania courts to determine who should be the guardian of mom and how things should be handled. Again, this is in a situation where mom doesn't have the capacity to make these types of decisions as to where to live and who to live with on her own. And also as part of the act, uh, we will now recognize an international guardianship. So if somebody was appointed a guardian or a similar title in another country, since we have adopted this uniform act, we will recognize that here as well. Here are some additional resources. So again, as I said at the beginning, you know, none of this was meant to be legal advice and it's not. Everybody's situation is very different, especially dealing with guardianship. It's very fact specific, especially if you're getting into arguments between family members, et cetera. So these are some ways that you can find a local attorney. Uh, very specifically, NALA.org is the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. And if you go to that website, they have a link to finding an attorney and you can put in your location either by title or zip code and then search for lawyers within 5, uh, 15 or 25 miles from where you're located and find an attorney who is part of this National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys and can seek consultation with them as to how to handle your situation. Also, your local bar association will usually have a referral service um, where attorneys have registered with them as being able to take on those referrals. And I, do, I think we're all set now and ready to take questions. Perfect. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I certainly learned some new things today. Um, and we do have a question waiting. Uh, are you, uh, are self-initiated guardianships on consent always granted by the court? Is there a process to evaluate the request? Is this process easier than when initiated by someone else? Um, I won't say, uh, okay. I'm going to slow myself down. So a self-initiated guardianship, first of all, I'll say they're fairly rare. Um, I will tell you I was recently in a county of New York City bringing one of these guardianships about three weeks ago, and the judge's clerk told me that this was the second one that they had seen in 2018. And, and New York City's, you know, the, the counties are pretty large. So they are very rare. Um, because most people who have the ability to um, to say that they want a guardian will have the capacity to sign a power of attorney, and then therefore it doesn't have all of these issues of, of court oversight and all of that. However, in a situation like the one I had, there there is not a, a shorter proceeding um, 
the court obviously wants to follow the wishes of the person who we're talking about having a guardian appointed for, but there is still a court evaluator appointed. They still, and again, this is in New York, they still do a full report where they speak to everybody involved, they find out what's going on, and they make a report to the court. Um, of course, that is a much easier court hearing and proceeding than one where you have three family members and everybody's fighting and, and it's much longer and there's witnesses, et cetera. Um, but it does still require that the need for a guardian be established. So you can't just go to the court and say, I want a guardian for no reason. You need to establish a strong need for that guardian. Thank you. I have another question that's asking, could Adult Protective Service representatives initiate a guardianship on behalf of one of their clients? So the way it usually works is that if an Adult um, Protective Services employee is called to a home or called to a situation and they find that it is an unsafe situation and a guardian is necessary, then they will make that referral to the local municipality. So again, uh, you know, I practice in New York City, so APS will make a report to, to the New York City Legal Department. And then the city is the petitioner of the guardianship in that situation. And the APS worker is usually their witness who is establishing on behalf of the city who is, what the reason is, what the need for the guardian is, and also often stating if there's any persons that are making the individual be vulnerable or, or, or put them in danger, they're putting that on the record with the court as well. Thank you. We have another question. Is a power of attorney short form, can it be used in short term for benefits and entitlement instead of guardianship? Yes. So uh, when we talk about ways to avoid a guardianship, one way to avoid a guardianship is by having a valid and comprehensive power of attorney document created. So uh, as I said, we often see people come in with powers of attorney who that either were not validly executed under the laws of the state in which it was executed, or it doesn't have all of the powers necessary. And every, again, just like guardianship, every state's laws regarding power of attorney are going to be different. Here in New York, and I'm, I'm assuming the person who asked that question is likely from New York because that's a term that's often used as a short form power of attorney. Um, you know, our standard power of attorney as elder law attorneys at this point, I believe is about 16 pages long and that's our short form. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a misnomer, but as long as it has all of the powers required to act on that person's behalf, that is a, it is not only a reason to not bring a guardianship, but it is also a defense to a guardianship. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I apologize, I missed Thor a second part of a question that you uh, had initially answered the first question. The second part is, so it's easier to initiate, implement, an existing power of attorney than to go through on consent guardianship? But I don't know if that's a uh, question or a comment. I, I think that what they're, I, I believe what that question is asking is, is it easier to sign a power of attorney than go for guardianship? And the answer is definitely yes. To sign a power of attorney, as long as somebody has the mental capacity to sign that document to, to seek out a lawyer, and, or, or if not them was a lawyer, to seek out the document and to validly sign it, sign before a notary. In New York State, you know, you need a notary, you need witnesses. Um, then that is obviously much easier because you're able to say, these are the powers I want to give someone and I'm consenting and I'm that I'm willing to do this and it's just a matter of a signature as opposed to a long drawn out proceeding which then has follow up reporting or accounting requirements. Thank you. And will you give a few more specific examples about the conditions for guardianship? Example, what kind of cognitive impairment, examples of inabilities, et cetera? Sure. So what we see a lot of are people who, again, it's a factual determination. So what are the functions of day-to-day -day living that you need to perform? And is there someone who is legally authorized to perform those for you if you're unable to do it for yourself? So for example, if somebody is unable to bathe themselves, 
that's not necessarily a reason to have a guardianship because you can hire a home health aide to bathe you. But if you're not able to call up the agency and say, I need somebody to come into my home and bathe me, and you're not able to balance the checkbook and to get that check out to pay the agency on time for that aid, it's those other things that create the need for the guardian, the inability to gather that care for yourself and to pay for it and manage the finances of it. And so if you need somebody to do that for you and you have not signed a power of attorney that gives someone that authority and you've not signed a healthcare proxy that allows someone to uh, put that care in place for you, then a guardianship may be necessary if you're unable to do those things for yourself. Thank you. How can a family member get a guardian change if she feels he is not addressing the mother's needs? So a, a guardian can be removed if uh, by petitioning the court. So again, this is going to be a state-specific question as how exactly to do it. But in New York State, the way you do it is by submitting a petition to the court, um, which is basically a motion that you file with the court that will say that you would like the guardian to be removed and all the reasons that you would like them to be removed, and then the court will respond accordingly. Some courts will have a hearing on the matter. Some courts will ask for a conference. Um, it's handled in different ways depending on not just what state, but maybe what county or what judge you're in front of, and they'll make that decision. Um, there are often, and I know in the courts in New York, there are guardianship offices that are specifically set up to help individuals who have not hired a lawyer um, in getting the papers filed properly. Because unfortunately, not only do you have to get the information to the court about why you want the guardian to be removed, but you also have to do it in a legally accepted way for how pleadings are filed in a court proceeding. We have another question. Does a guardian appointed in a will have the same responsibilities as you describe here for a court-appointed guardian? What facts would support successfully contesting a guardianship of mother by one child instead of another? Are attorney fees awarded to the victor in this type of contest, if necessary, to hire an attorney or go to court? Okay, I may answer one at a time and ask you to, to repeat those. So the first question was, are the powers the same? That's okay. Are the powers the same for a, a guardian appointed in a will? The only time that we usually in our estate planning appoint a guardian in a will is a guardian to be named for a minor child if that becomes necessary, if both parents um, are unable to care for that child. And a last will and testament is only dealt with after the death of the individual. So that is a different, that's a totally different system of guardianship. That's a guardian for a minor, whereas what we're talking about here are guardianship for adults. So that it will not be the same as the guardianship for a minor, although it, it can be similar. Usually a guardian for a minor has full authority and it's not the focus on the least restrictive alternative like it is for an adult. Can you tell me the next question? Right. In that, the second in that one, what, what facts would support successfully contesting a guardianship of mother by one child instead of another? Right. So this, this unfortunately happens quite a bit. Um, so, for example, if one, I had a case where uh, one daughter decided that the other daughter was mistreating mom and that uh, if mom had a say and if mom could say what she wanted, mom would say she was being taken advantage of and she wouldn't want um, the daughter who was living with her to be there. And so the, the client that I had wanted to petition the court to have him, uh, herself appointed as guardian for her mother um, to kind of save her from this situation. And the information that would have to be put forth is information that the mother was unable to make her own decisions or that her the decisions she was making were under duress. Um, and it would probably require that when the court evaluator did their investigation, 
that when taken aside, that the mother uh, informed the court that not only either exhibit that she can't make decisions on her own and that she wasn't choosing for things to be the way they were or exhibiting that she could make decisions on her own but that her decisions were because of fear of of the way she was being treated um and so if one child is trying to get guardianship over the mother um over their other sibling they usually have to show again that mom's in harm that she is unable to make these decisions on her own or that she's being uh she is vulnerable to being taken advantage of and that there's nothing in place now if there's a power of attorney in place with the other with the daughter who's with mom all the time you need to prove that that power of attorney is being misused that the daughter who is the agent under the power of attorney is not acting appropriately is doing something against mom's wishes or is stealing or is doing something against what the state requires her to do as the fiduciary of mom's assets. Okay, the last part of that question, are attorney fees awarded to the victor in this type of contest, if necessary, to hire an attorney or to go to court? So attorney fees in, in guardianship proceedings, I think I touched on this briefly, but I'll expand upon it. Attorney's fees, if, if a guardianship goes as expected, if a person is, a petition is brought, the individual is deemed to be incapacitated, the guardian is appointed, and that's the end of the story, then the fees are usually paid out of the inc person, incapacitated person's assets, and the fees are paid for everybody involved. So the attorney for the one who brought the petition, as well as anyone else involved. However, if it's a situation where daughter one brings a guardianship for mom and daughter two contests it, and in the end, daughter two wins and, and mom wins and no guardian is appointed, then the court has the discretion to say that the fees should be paid out of daughter one, the petitioning daughter's funds, and that she's required to pay the fees. And so it is always, in New York at least, it's up to the court to determine how the fees are paid. So generally when we're starting with a client and there is a contentious matter, we want them to be very clear on the front end that this is a big risk that this could happen. And so you want to make sure that, you know, what's going to happen at that hearing either way that you understand the risk that you're taking by bringing that proceeding. Okay, we have, thank you. We have another question. How many times can a client change guardianship? Um, generally speaking, once a guardian is appointed that by the court, that person is going to remain on as guardian until somebody complains and they are removed or unless they petition to be removed themselves. There are sometimes attorneys who act as people's guardians who then decide to retire or leave the business or move out of the or out of the state, in which case they may petition the court to have another replacement. Um, or again, it could be that the person who has a guardian appointed for them um, or a family member has the guardian removed for misaction. There's no set amount of times. Um, I'll say it's not often that they change over very frequently. Usually a guardian who's acting will stay for a long duration. Thank you. Um, we have another question, um, piggybacking on one that you answered um, a short while ago. I think I'm confused because the power of attorney docs that my parents have signed are in case they are unable or unwilling to take care of their own affairs. But we feel they are now unable, and so we have to go through a process to implement the POAs. And that process is easier than initiating a guardianship. So yes, the when so, when someone signs a power of attorney document, it is in effect when they sign it. And again, this is going to be state specific, but if you think about it, if if you have a bank account, say you have a checking account with a bank and you have a power of attorney document that you signed with a lawyer, if the bank doesn't have that power of attorney on file and they haven't sent it through their legal department, 
then you can't sign as agent under the power of attorney, you can't sign checks on that account because the bank doesn't know that you are the power of attorney and they have not looked at the document and found it to be valid. So that is a necessary process to go through that the bank has to get a copy of the power of attorney, they have to approve it, and then the power of attorney is put on the account and the agent can act. That in most cases is going to be much simpler than having a guardianship because a guardianship is going to require, first of all, if you have a valid power of attorney, the court may not even grant a guardianship. But beyond that, even if the court did submit an order, you're still gonna have to go through the process of getting that order on file with the bank so that the bank will honor it and honor that the person is acting on the other person's behalf. So it, it, if the power of attorney is a valid power of attorney, then it should be, um, it will be an easier process than doing a guardianship. I'll also point out that some, some people in New York State and in other states may have something known as a springing power of attorney, um, or they may call it something else other places, that basically is a document that only comes into effect if a person is incapacitated. Most of our clients have powers of attorney that are in effect whether or not they are incapacitated, so it doesn't rely on that. But if it is a power of attorney that relies on the person being incapacitated, it may require that a doctor or medical professional put it into effect in that a doctor has to say that a person is unable to handle their affairs and that they need the power of attorney to act on their behalf. And so that's often an extra step with the power of attorney if it is a springing power of attorney. Okay, we have another question. Is there a standard amount guardian is paid or does it vary? And are they paid monthly or yearly? Usually it's an annual commission. Um, and in New York State, the court will usually set it based on a statute um, under the Surrogates Court Act, which is a statute for, for executors. And it has to do with the amount of assets being handled by the court. But in certain circumstances, the court can set up a different scheme for payment as well. But it's usually an annual payment unless the court specifically specifies that it be monthly or on some other schedule. Thank you. Um, we've been getting a lot of comments about how this has been so helpful to everybody. Um, and a lot of their questions were answered. Uh, we do have a couple of moments for some more questions, so please feel free to take your time um, and type them in, and I know Britt will be happy to answer, but we have gotten a lot of feedback how wonderful today's presentation and informative it has been. So thank you, uh, Britt. Thank you. I also just put up um, the last slide, which is the resources and support um, for the AFA as well. Thank you. Um, while we're waiting um, perhaps for another question or two, I know we're winding down, I want to welcome everybody back to our next month's presentation. It will be on September 13th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. The topic is going to be prior trauma, aging, and the experience of care recipients. And our guest presenter is Dr. Arit Felsen. She's a clinical psychologist. So I would love for everyone to join us next month for our Care Connection webinar. We actually have two more questions. Um, is that okay? Do you have time to answer them? Yes. Okay. So what happens if the AIP is low income and cannot afford the guardianship fees if appointed to pay them by the court? So uh, th that is something that's going to depend on, on where the person is located. Uh, we have offices in different parts of New York State and in different counties. In New York City, there's something called a community guardian. So these are agencies that have caseworkers, and basically the agency becomes the guardian, and the caseworkers manage the cases. And that's done in a lot of low-income, low-asset cases. Um, but I know... For example, out on Long Island in our Suffolk County offices, the Suffolk County courts don't have the avail availability of community guardians. So very often if, if there is a, if it is a, first of all, a guardian can always be a family member and there's a preference for family members if there's someone to serve. But if there is not someone to serve as part of the family, then the court 
appoints a lawyer. And basically what ends up happening is lawyers who do this on a regular basis will often get multiple um, appointments from the court with the understanding that some of them will have a monetary payout and some of them won't. And that's just something that when you practice in this area, I think you're, you're aware of um, the reality of the situation. And usually the court, you know, the court tries to make sure that, you know, they are appointing people who know what they're doing, but that they're people who understand that on certain cases there may not be payment. Okay, so we do have another question. Um, follow up on that point about the power of attorney. I counsel many caregivers of people with dementia who struggle with getting the affirm affirmation about person's disability status. Could you clarify how a person can set up a power of attorney that would now require this step, but be in effect at the time it is made? So I'm not aware of the document that that, that person is referring to, but I know that with our clients, um, they, we often have something called an affidavit of full force and effect uh, that some banks or other institutions in New York want someone to sign. And that's basically an affidavit saying that this document is valid um, and was valid at the time it was signed, that the person had capacity to, to their not, I believe it says to their knowledge, um, it hasn't been revoked, it is still in effect. Um, and so it doesn't have to be the purpose uh, many times you'll hear the term durable power of attorney. And in New York State, all powers of attorney are deemed to be durable if signed after 2010. They're all signed, uh, presumed to be durable as long as they don't say they are not. And what that means is they are in effect while somebody has their capacity, but through the duration of incapacity as well. So durable means it lasts throughout incapacity. So it should be um, based on your state law, could be the difference here. But here in New York, if it was valid when it was signed, it will be valid down the line when that person becomes incapacitated as long as the document doesn't say that it loses its effect upon incapacity. Okay, that rounds it up for our questions. Um, Britt, I certainly want to thank you for your expertise and for volunteering your time for today's Care Connection webinar program. Again, I certainly learned a lot of information. I know our listeners by letting me know they felt this was so informative. And again, I am giving you a heartfelt thanks. Um, I hope to be uh, having all of you tune in next month uh, for our next Care Connection webinar. Um, and as always, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, everybody, for listening to today's presentation, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.